Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video we're going to take another turn on the Nadine Doris merry-go-round as she formally submitted her resignation letter last night to Rishi Sunak, which means that the formal process for binning her can begin as soon as Parliament reconvenes next month. But although Doris had obviously been forced to formally resign before she really intended, she used the opportunity to launch a stinging attack on Sunak and, of course, by extension, her own party in government. But first, if you like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So before I go over some of the more incredible details in the resignation letter, if ever there were a cautionary tale not to allow self-absorbed egomaniacs to stand as a candidate in your political party, and if you do, for whatever you do, do not promote them, Nadine Doris is it. In actual fact, they've had a few lessons. Arguably, Boris Johnson caused the most damage to the party, but he was at least useful to them for a few months at the end of 2019. They got something out of him. Doris has never been of the blindest bit of use to the Conservative Party. For all her talking of increasing her majority in her mid-Bedfordshire seat, as if it wasn't a similar pattern replicated across the Tory heartlands and related to entirely national matters, Doris has never once been an asset to the party. The one time someone actually had a job for her, Boris Johnson, nads, I need you to privatise Channel 4, I don't like the way they humiliated me. She couldn't even get that right. Thankfully to those who value Channel 4, I suppose. Um, and 11 weeks ago, after finding out that she wasn't going to go to the House of Lords, which was about a fortnight after I found out, I did a video on it. Published a video on it. I like, if I knew, how did she not know? So she said she was going to resign with immediate effect in a strop. Nearly three months later, and immediate effect was ongoing some serious strain. Over the past week, there it was fairly obvious there was some serious pressure building up from within the Conservative Party for her to either make good on her decision to resign um, or to actually do some work because her local constituents are getting really angry. What had happened, I think, after the by-elections particularly, the Lib Dems and Labour focusing on mid-Bedfordshire and really making this point, you've got no MP. You haven't got an MP. The Tories are leaving you without an MP. And constituents were not happy about this, understandably. So she seemed to buckle under that pressure. And for the avoidance of doubt, no, there is zero chance that this is when she'd planned to actually resign. It makes no strategic sense. If she wasn't going to do it with actual immediate effect, it was going to be when she thought it was most damaging to Sunak. Possibly just before the conference recess. But her hand seems to have been forced. She is reliant upon the goodwill of lots of Conservative supporters because apart from anything else, she wants them to buy her book next month. And the book was very much part of this letter. The book, by the way, is a it's not one of her usual tawdry uh, novels. It's a conspiracy theory attacking everyone she feels is responsible for the downfall of Boris Johnson. And judging by her very lengthy letter of resignation, which contained not one syllable of dignity, it is clear that she's got Rishi Sunak in particular in her sights and she does not care about the collateral damage to the entire party because this is self-defeating. Sunak's the prime minister and leader of her party. Any attacks against him, especially on political grounds, if they're not going to remove him and replace him, are an attack on her party. Like, I don't know how many Conservative MPs will be picking up a copy of her book, but I'll tell you something, Labour strategists absolutely will. If this letter's anything to go by, oh, they will. It will be worth wading through the badly composed vitriol to get some grade A material for the election campaign. Whatever Doris may intend to result from her attacks, the Tory party's best chance is to go into the election campaign with some reasonably strong platforms and Rishi Sunak leading them. Because if you look at the alternatives, if Rishi Sunak is leading to the election, as is almost certain, Doris has now just given Labour even more ammunition against a Prime Minister already vulnerable. If the attacks against him, say, go so badly, he ends up taking the party into Liz Trust territory, then, OK, replacing him becomes possible. But that will not save the party because the public will be outraged by more internal squabbles. Labour will be able to say, we've got crises here. We've got economic crises, healthcare crises. Everything is a crisis and it's a crisis caused by the Tories. And what are they doing? Are they working to fix it? No, they're focused on their own internal squabbling. Send them packing and people will. There is no outcome 
from either Doris's letter or her book, which can possibly benefit the Conservative Party, no matter the views of, of any supporter as to the suitability of Rishi Sunak. But her letter was a mix of both attacks and incredulous defences. Like, she insisted that she had been doing her duty as MP. I have I've been working very hard as an MP. Like, if her constituents have not seen any evidence, no, she hasn't. There is very little behind the scenes about the job of a local MP. Like in government, sometimes, yes, of course. Sometimes a minister can be doing very hard work and it's not necessarily all that visible because it's lots of discussions behind the scenes. But not in your constituency. Like pretty much every local duty for an MP is really very visible. You know, if you're doing um, a visit to, say, a local business or a school or a hospital, you know, your fact-finding uh, visits, they're very visible. They'll end up in the papers. If you're doing your local surgeries, well, they're visible. You're advertising them. If you're do, running a campaign, lo a local campaign, or taking that campaign to Westminster, that's very visible because that's the a campaign needs to be visible. Whatever they do in their local constituency is by definition visible. She has been invisible. She also insisted that it was people within the Conservative Party who persuaded her not to resign immediately. Oh, I was going to totally resign immediately, just like I said, you know, because I always keep my word. But then people persuaded me. Uh, oh, it was going to be it was going to be another damaging by-election for the party. We thought it would be best not to have that. What an obvious lie. Like, she says to avoid inflicting another damaging by-election on the party. But the longer this drags on, the more damaging it is. Sonak wanted the by-election before summer, and for good reason. If it had taken place with the others, the Tories actually had their best chance of winning it. They probably would have done. Because Labour were throwing the kitchen sink at Selby and they really wanted Uxbridge. Those were their foci. The Liberal Democrats were focusing very much on Somerton and Frome. Right? So the Tories pretty much had a clear run at mid-Bedfordshire if they'd have taken place at the same time. They, you know, Labour couldn't afford to throw the kitchen sink at Doris's mid-Bedfordshire seat, nor could the Lib Dems. The Lib Dems had been really working on Somerton. Also, the longer that Doris was not resigning and not doing her job, the more Labour and the Lib Dems are able to knock on doors and point out the Tories are failing you, you know, They're not doing anything for you. Now, the Tories may still will the, uh, win the resultant by-election, not least of the fact it's not actually clear which of Labour or the Lib Dems has the best shot at it. At the moment, you'd think Labour, but, it, you know. They're both going for it. So they may end up just knocking each other out and letting the Tories win. But the task is nonetheless made more difficult by Nads. She was 100% absolutely not delaying because of persuasion from within her party. Um, she's done this purely out of spite against Sunak. I think what may have happened is she thought, I'm going to resign, I'll leave you with a bite. Because remember, the, the point of uh, this idea of deferring the House of Lords seats until after the election, was to avoid damaging by-elections to the party. So that's what she had in her head. Oh, a by-election would be damaging. Oh, I can't go to the House of Lords. Right, I'll give him the damaging by-election, see how he likes that. And then it turned out he seemed quite eager to have the election as soon as possible. And she probably thought, oh, hang on a minute. Hold on. No, 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 no. Why do you want this by-election really quickly? And that's why I think she, she delayed. In fact, the very last line of her letter alludes to the fact that Sunak wants the by-election to take place quickly. She was clearly quite resentful about it. So it's incredibly obvious she delayed her decision to spite Sunak. Not because anyone pointed out that it would be bad for the party. Also, she had any concern for the party. Why would she be attacking it like this? This letter is attacking the... Her intention is to just attack Sunak. But there's nothing surgical about this attack. It's very much an attack on the party. Because... She's not attacking him personally. She does a bit. She has a few personal attacks. But it's mostly attacking the government and including the government she was part of because she's attacking his time as chancellor as well. Like, it would be different, say, if the party had the time and person capable of taking over and getting the party back into shape for the election. You know, much like when they got rid of Theresa May, that sort of worked out for them because they replaced her with someone who then won that election. But choosing Sunak you know, when they did last year, was already an act of desperation. They knew there was no other credible candidate. That is why Tory MPs changed the system for electing the next leader, to try and avoid letting party members choose another nut job. These attacks cannot bring Sunak down and let the party recover. They can only damage the party. And if it does end up bringing Sunak down, it damages the party more because despite the fact that 
Sonak is is annoying the public, which I'll be talking about more uh, later today or tomorrow. He's still more popular than his party. Now, the Conservative Party, you know, as grim as it is for Conservative supporters, really don't have anyone better. The fact that he's not good enough is neither here nor there. They do not have anyone better. Put it this way, it will be Labour MPs who are smiling as they read this letter, not Conservative MPs. I was pissing myself. Most of her letter comprised non too subtle attacks on Rishi Sunak as both Chancellor and Prime Minister. She made him out to be someone who, instead of doing his job, spent his time strutting in front of the camera in expensive designer clothes. There was one quote in the letter, for example. You flashed your gleaming smile in your Prada shoes and Savile Row suit from behind a camera, but you just weren't listening. This from the Secretary of State for Media trying to privatise Channel 4 on the basis it was costing the taxpayer too much when it doesn't cost the taxpayer a penny. This is the one who gets to accuse others of not listening. The fact that it's true is neither here nor there. It's abject hypocrisy. More than that, a naked attempt to make things worse for her own party. She attacks the undemocratic way in which Sonak became Prime Minister, where no general election was involved, largely glossing over the fact, although she didn't ignore it completely, that Boris Johnson became Prime Minister when he was under exactly the same circumstances. But essentially, her letter was an obvious plug for her book. Throughout it, she was referencing this, this publication, saying she felt compelled to tell the truth about the dark story within her party. I said earlier this week, I thought the pressure from within the party had a decent chance of working because these are the target audience for a book. Like, who's she going to sell this book to? It's a book about how they were mean to my poor Boris. Who's going to buy that? Aside from a few Labour strategists looking for easy attacks against the Conservatives. The, 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 there's only Conservative supporters. That is the target audience. It's not going to be considered like uh, an interesting tone by even like political analysts, the odd one may get a, a free copy. I can't imagine too many will buy it. Just to, I don't imagine. There'll be reviews in the papers, but they'll be given that copy. So if she pisses off Conservative supporters, her book will flop like Matt Hancock's. And th she then tried to justify not attending Parliament because she'd done the constituency. Oh, I was working my constituency. Your constituency aren't seen you. Uh, they're blind. Uh, but then she had to tackle why she hadn't attended Parliament. Oh, it was it was because it's it was incompatible with writing a book exposing corruption within the Conservative Party. Well, absolute tosh. If you are writing a book on something, real authors go to a lot of trouble to get themselves as close to the source material as possible. The idea is, oh, it'd be very bad to be near my source material. What a stupid thing to say. But at the time I was just over halfway through the letter, she was going full Donald Trump properly off the deep end. The, the powerful forces who run the country are all arranged against poor nads. She didn't quite use the term witch hunt this time, but she may as well have. She talked about how proud she was of the levelling up agenda and how Sunak trashed it, despite the fact that none of it was implemented when Johnson was Prime Minister. In fact, it all went in reverse. It was in reverse with Johnson as Prime Minister. Of course, it's true that Sunak had no interest in it and as Chancellor tried to block it, absolutely. But Johnson was the boss, wasn't he? Johnson was the boss. And her final point was that she would be doing her best to split the Conservative Party with her book. In other words, she wanted to expose the barely contained divisions in her party in the final year leading up to a general election. All I can say is if there are a significant number of Conservative members who will go along with this, then if for no other reason, and there are plenty of reasons, they deserve to lose and lose badly. Because, if, you know, if you're a Conservative supporter and you actually want, despite everything, the Conservatives to win the next election, you should be horrified at what Nadine Doris is doing. Absolutely horrified. This was an incredibly self-defeating letter. Deluded, deranged and deeply damaging. Labour are laughing their tits off right now. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.